Hi, my name is Rick. I'm from Ukraine. The video you're about to see is an interview with a Russian soldier in Ukrainian captivity made by Ukrainian journalist Volodymyr Zolkin. I wish to make this kind of content available to more people around the world. This is why I decided to dub it into English. It's not much, but it's honest work. All rights belong to Zolkin and his team. Please enjoy. In the left corner, Volodymyr Zolkin. Can you please keep your hands on the table? Because some have prejudices that they are tied, tied or something like that. Your hands aren't tied. I'm a civilian journalist. My name is Volodymyr. Our conversation is a talk, absolutely voluntary. I mean, it's even more a talk than an interview. I got it. Do you understand that it is happening for the record and for publishing? Yes. You don't mind? I don't mind. Are you ready to talk? Yes, I am. Then, if you're ready to talk, say a full name. I am Jaro Dmitry Alexandrovich. Date of birth, 1st of January 2002. Where are you from? I'm from the city of Rezan. From the city of Rezan. Tell us your story. As I understood, you ended up in Ukraine twice. Yes, that's right. First time I served a contract in the airborne forces. Yes. And we've been told that we're heading for training in Belarus. We arrived in Belarus and stayed there for two or three weeks. And from there, at night, at three or four in the morning, we were raised by alarm, sat into BMDs, armored landing body vehicles, and entered the territory of Ukraine from Chernobyl's side. I forgot to ask you, rank, position, unit, private, position, machine gunner. At the time when I served on contract, it was Regiment 137. And at this moment, I'm here as a conscript. Got it, got it, it's interesting. Well, uh, keep going from the moment you stopped. So we arrived in Ukraine through Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. So we arrived, and I was here from February 24th until the 2nd of August. I don't know which villages we were in exactly. I know that we got surrounded for the first time. On the fourth day, almost all the equipment that we got was burned down. All these BMDs burned down how? By itself? It was destroyed by artillery. Were there victims? Yes, a lot. And what was happening with these 200s and 300s? I cannot know that. You didn't see it with your own eyes? With my own eyes, I didn't. Okay. So then somehow we left that encircled position. I mean, we started moving again. And we were surrounded again, approximately in four days. This time we were surrounded for four or six days. Then we went out again, kept moving straight ahead, and at one moment, sometimes closer to April, we were told to turn around and leave Ukraine. So we went out to Belarus again, and they've told us that we'll be entering from some western direction. We started moving, ammunition on the arrived, remaining equipment loaded on the train, broken, not broken. So we went to western direction, stopped in some wood. Stop. What was in Belarus? You arrived to Belarus. To Belarus? Yes. So we went back to Belarus? Yes. So we began to drag our equipment and moved ourselves closer to the train station, to Echelon. Before you didn't get too far, I'd like to ask you, can you give us the numbers of equipment? How many vehicles were in your columns? How many people came in? And how many vehicles came in, give or take? From our direction, two battalion tactical groups. In numbers, we're civilians, we don't get it, I'll tell you. 70 people in company, 210, 200, 400, 420 people, give or take. Is it a total number of those who came from Chernobyl's side? Yes, these were two battalion tactical groups. And how many went out? Somehow we went out separately. Our battalion went out by itself. The other battalion went out earlier. In this case, how many losses did you have? Maybe you can name the percentage. Losses? Since the beginning, there were heavy losses. I don't even know. How many? 10% of personnel? 20? Maybe more? About 20% probably. About 20% of personnel. And when we escaped to Belarus, loaded on trains to change direction, were there MLRS with you, for example? 
multi-launch rocket systems. No, I didn't see them. And what equipment was there? BMD, armored landing body vehicle. We had one Nona with us. What is Nona? Ground cannon of the newest artillery. Mm -hmm. It's an equipment of airborne. And were you shooting anywhere from this Nona? I don't know, we weren't close to Nona. We were moving separately. And we also had BMDs. Mm -hmm. So we went out to Belarus to change direction. Loaded, left, I don't know exactly where we arrived. To western direction, that's what we were told. And when unloaded, why aren't you wearing a peacoat? Everyone's walking around in peacoats, but not you. Here's a jacket for you. Thank you, thank you. It's not warm in here. So, when we unloaded, we had two weeks before relocating to western direction. We were located somewhere close to the border and our company commander was adequate. Those who didn't want to keep moving approached him. Approached him in Belarus? Yes, when we were on the territory of Russia. We gathered people. So in Belarus or in Russia? We moved out from Belarus and they told us that we're gonna be located on the territory of Russia for now. So we approached him and explained to him that we don't want to go back to Ukraine. I mean, for the first time we didn't know that we'll enter Ukrainian territory. We had an adequate company commander. He gave us back our IDs and said, I don't know what will happen to you next, but you can go. So we left back to our military unit on our own. We checked in. You refuse to come back to Ukraine? We refuse to have the seal in my military ID. What seal? It says prone to betrayal, lies and deception. Refuse to participate in special military operation on the territory of Ukraine. So it was given to you back then in April? They gave it to me when they started firing me. I'll tell you about this now. Okay, okay, tell us. So we left, arrived to the military unit, checked in. They've told us that for now we'll be there as contractors. We remained there and were the part of Tula Division. There's an airborne division in Tula. A political officer of Tula Division, Colonel Bikov, came to us. He came to us and told us that we'll all be imprisoned for 12 years because we refused to go for the second time. He kept telling us this for two weeks. And then it appeared that he was imprisoned instead. It appeared that he was still in the humanitarian aid that's been sent to us. Interesting. It turned out humanitarian aid has been sent to us, we just didn't know about it. How were you fed in there? Initially they gave one dry ration to each of us. And then just told us, guys, we just can't deliver the food to you. And what were you eating? Well, basements, not basements. If we got lucky, then some compot, not compot. No, basements, not basements, compot, not compot. Was it all from the basements of Ukrainian civilians? Yes. I mean, if we had where to take this food. And we were also driving from forest to church to get water. So in general, you ate what you could find in basements? Yeah, because with just compot you can't really gorge on. Yes, you can't. I assumed that there was also some potatoes and some preserves and maybe some salo. Yes, 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 conservation, potatoes, exactly. And what about livestock? Chickens, pigs? No, I didn't see any of it at all. There wasn't. Got it. You freed. In first months of war, you already freed Ukrainians from food. Do you know that there, in Russia, they say that you're liberators? I don't know what they say in there. Have you watched the TV in Russia? I'm not really into TV. I just know that something, somehow, some conflict is happening here. Something, somehow, some conflict is happening here? That they're having a war, a conflict? Okay, let's not talk about it now. Not getting deep into politics. The story itself is interesting, that's why I keep telling it. So eventually, when he, Colonel, was imprisoned, I mean, as it appeared later, we kept walking around, and during the weekend, they reported us, gave us a severe reprimand, they fired us, gave us the cover-up list, to go around and gather signatures, return stuff they gave us. And after we did all of this, we received our military IDs, and there were these seals. I also had trials concerning these seals. And what was the position of that person who was supposed to bring you humanitarian aid? 
He was the deputy commander on political work of Airborne Division of Tula. Can you imagine? Deputy commander on political work. Maybe colonel. Yes, colonel. Stealing humanitarian aid from soldiers. I understand. At the same time, yells at them, go there and die. It doesn't matter if you watch TV or you don't. Recall all those propagandists of yours. Solovyov, Simonyan, Skabeva. All of them own villas in Europe. All of them own cars that are American, Japanese, but not only Russian. All of their kids are studying on this decaying West. And all of them are screaming to you from TV that you must go to Ukraine and die. That's how it is, you see? So, they've put you that unfortunate seal. And what about trials? What was it? About trials. I sued them in my district. Oh, so it was you who sued them to a military court on the illegality of that seal. My trial was moved to Moscow. And then they mobilized me. So now my mother is engaged in trials on my behalf. My mother is visiting court now. In general, from what months to what months you were in Russia? In Russia, since the 2nd of April, when I went out for the first time. And I spent about three months there. Two months of vacation and a month of looking for a job. And then conscription was introduced. And not to be conscripted. I wanted to go to study at the railway college. I had a reservation. I collected all the documents, gathered everything. Only four days left until my college reservation on the 11th. 11th of what? September? No. On 22nd of September they only introduced it. October. On the 11th of October you were conscripted? No, I received summons on 4th. It was only signed on 4th. I was taken on 6th or 7th around these days. And on 11th I was supposed to go study to Moscow by that reservation. Okay, what about the period before April? Did you tell us everything? Are you sure there was nothing else interesting there? Until April. When we went to Ukraine for the first time? Yes, were there some gunfights? There were no gunfights, we were mostly shelled by artillery. That's it? Okay, got it. Drones chased us? Got it. Chased and chased. And now comes the moment when you are conscripted. Yes, you know everything in advance. You already knew what's going on here, right? Yes, you can't be told that it's a training in here. You can't be told the same thing that is told to every single person who I've spoken here with. Some homeless people, convicts. I think you've already met them here. Yeah, so-so. They grab just anyone. They tell this to everyone, basically everyone. Except for the convicts, perhaps. But sometimes to convicts, too. That you will not fight, you will stand somewhere at checkpoints. Exactly. That's how it was. But they probably couldn't pull the wool over your eyes. You understood what was happening there. No, I understood what is happening here. But I didn't know how it happens with conscripts. I mean, I knew about conscripts, that they are entering Ukraine. And in theory, according to the law, they should be located either 30 or 80 kilometers from hostilities. That is, they should be located in the rear. So conscripts are located in the rear area by the law. By what kind of law? In Russia, in my thinking, there is a law that conscripts must be located in the rear area, that they must not be sent anywhere. That's what they tell everyone, to all of you. And it seems that you believe this too, that you'll be located in the rear area. Everything turned out differently. When will the gray matter of Russians start moving in their heads? No idea. Do you understand that I'm not insulting anyone right now? I understand. I am stating the fact. I understand. The gray matter wasn't working. This is clear. Like a jelly. I mean, you knew what was going on and you still believed that you will stand somewhere and you won't fight. Have you heard that there's a new law that they will imprison refuseniks now? And did they put someone in jail? I don't know. See, again, you know only the half of information. I only know the laws. There's a law, but they don't imprison. I have no idea. I can't say anything about this. Why do you think they don't imprison? It's if you believe me that they don't. Why they don't imprison? Because you can't imprison everyone. Well, exactly. You understand this. Because if they're in Russia, they'll start to imprison all those who refuse. 
there won't be enough prison cells. Maybe there will be enough cells, because there will be enough cells, 100%. Country prison, in fact. Probably there will be enough cells, but so many criminal cases will appear. And it will be so difficult to hide this from public, when people will talk about it among themselves. That it will appear that you're not that eager to go fight somewhere by the call of these propagandists. So, in fact, you understand everything. I understand that you don't need it. And this war, in fact, is needed by no one, except by some in power. The last speaker, or the one before him, said that some tycoons are forcing Putin. We, ordinary people, don't need no war, no territory. We don't need any of this. You don't, because you have your own problems. And you have more than enough territory. Our own problems and family. Least densely populated area is exactly in Russia. Maybe you lack something, but territory is more than enough. We have a lot of territories. To go and die for some other territory is not very justified. I agree. But nevertheless, you were summoned for the second time. They mobilized you, you went. What happened next? We arrived, they brought us on a train from Mulina. I was sent to Mulina after the draft board. So they brought us from Mulina on the echelon between all the new Oskol. By the way, wasn't anyone bothered by the fact that you had that seal in your military ID? On this occasion, I also asked them, I said, how do you mobilize me if in the first lines of that seal is written that I'm prone to betrayal, lies and deceit? They said, oh, it's okay. I say, how it's okay, at least remove it. They, it will be cancelled later. Well, it's clear that they fooled me. I understand now that it won't be cancelled. They just took and sent me. And this seal did not bother anyone. Understandable. Among the homeless and convicts, you're a good option, I must say. Well, prone and prone, who cares? I'm not prone, they just written so. Well, it's for them. Got it. So, I interrupted you. In Mulino, all this regiment was grouped and sent on the train. We arrived in the morning, somewhere between Stary and Novi Askol. I don't know what settlement is there. From there, on Kamaz and Ural trucks, with personal belongings, we were moving and in the night unloaded 10 kilometers from the village of Svistunovka, as I recall its name. There we unloaded in forestation. Not even a forest belt, just a forestation. Unloaded and stayed there. They said the field is a front. They've told us to sit there. We probably stayed there for two weeks. Then our company commander said, I will not lead people anywhere. God forbid they will die. I won't lead anyone. The order came to move somewhere. FSB took him after he disobeyed. To whom did he tell that? To his superiors. I don't know them personally. Were the superiors there with you? They came sometimes. Some major general. So he told them that he won't lead you. Yes, he said, I will not lead people anywhere. So he was taken away in the night. FSB took him. How do you know that it was FSB who took him? Someone saw it, they said that it was FSB. Got it. So they took him and the next day they lined us up, Major General arrived, the commander of this coup. What his name is? I have no idea, I don't serve there. So this Major General arrived, began to give us pep talks, saying you're on the territories, nothing will happen here. Everything is fine. Why are you so rebellious? He says, you received the equipment. We say, we have nothing. No night vision goggles. No thermal imagers. No personal medkits. Nothing. He says, all of this will be brought to you. And that day, company commander was brought back to us. And the next day, we were sent to the village of Novoselki if my memory serves me right. Either Novoselova or Novoselki. Sent us there, told us take these positions. House was the position. In a residential building, right? Yes, a residential building. There was no one there. Sit here, mm -hmm. liberated. Again, watch, here's the front. The field was visible through the window. We were sitting there, artillery was working. 
I don't know whose, ours, not ours, but next to us, we had incomings near us. And how was it with the food? Food in this house? No, in general, when you entered Ukraine for the second time. First time, oh, I mean second time, when we arrived as conscripts, they gave us a dry ration per person on first day. On the second day, one dry ration for three people. And then on the third day, it appeared that we had one dry ration for the squad for seven people. And then they started to deliver us the hot food somehow. But this food was just a water with cabbage or sticky pasta. Now we saw those jars with one cabbage swimming inside. And it is written on the jar, we don't leave our own. No, there was sheep and a big tin. And gave us one ladle of this cabbage soup per person. In ladle, I don't know, around 100 grams. It's almost water. Just water with cabbage, water with a slight taste. Have you fed up with it? No. As I understand, there were no local residents, twists and sellers, or was it? There weren't. And so, you're sitting in this house, we're sitting in this house, artillery is working, it was landing near us, we could hear it, and when it intensified, we were going down to the basement. So it was until the third day. On the third day, it exploded right under the windows of the house, everything began to crumble. We had two squads in the house. We went to the basement, sat in the basement, and heard how everything was exploding, and then we heard a voice shouting to us, leave the basement, lay down your weapons. Yes. So we laid our weapons in the basement, because we had nowhere to go. So we're walking out, looking around, and there's a unit of Ukrainian soldiers. And that unit was called Kraken. That's it. We were all taken, counted, sent to their location. I don't know where their base is. Of course, they blindfolded us. They took us there. We sat there for two days. From there, we were transported to some other place. We drove for a long time, also did not see anything. There was a room of some sort. We're not really interested in your adventures in captivity, by and large. They are of little interest to anyone. Or you want to tell us something interesting about it? No, then it appears that's all. I just got to this point and... Are you being fed in captivity? Yes. Better than at the front line? Yes, let's compare. Better. Better than at the front line? Better. Did you eat today? Not yet, they haven't brought it yet. But they feed us, yes. Air raid alarm started. There's an air raid alarm, yes. Pilaf, buckwheat. Pilaf and buckwheat, not she. No, not she. So, about your... We're interested in the story that took place before your captivity. And in captivity they feed you, constantly torturing you as I can see. No, no. Did they cut off something from you? They didn't cut anything. They feed us, there are beds, I have a place to sleep. Got it. About your stay at the front as part of the Russian army, so to say. Did you have such an opinion about the Russian army? Is this how it should all happen in case of hostilities? It shouldn't happen this way. There must be closing support, just like it should be with equipment and weapons and everything. And tasks should be properly communicated, what and how to do. They are currently conscripting all sorts of homeless people. Convicts are taken from prisons. I don't know about jails, jails are probably... Some of them are here with you. They are probably taken to some private military company, I think. Private military company is another matter. Do you have the law concerning private military companies? I don't know. Well, you don't have it. You have a mercenarism law. That it is prohibited. And this, in fact, is mercenarism. I have no idea about this. Okay, if you don't know, then you won't tell us anything about this. But we talked about how bad everything is there. With supplying and stuff. And now the moral side. Is it necessary at all? And if necessary, then why? Necessary to whom? Is this war necessary? Nobody needs this war. 
I think neither one side nor the other. If no one needed it, it wouldn't be happening. Then it is decided by someone above. Who is above? Zelensky decided that Russian troops should enter Ukraine? Either in Russia they decided, or in Ukraine, I have no idea. Could anyone in Ukraine decide that Russian troops should enter? I think not, because you're on your land here in Ukraine, and you're protecting it. It's the same as if someone attacked Russia. I would have quit my job, took a gun and went to defend my country. And you would have been right. And I would have been right. But in this case, everything is exactly the opposite. Honestly, I don't know why it started. Conscripts definitely don't need it. I think contract soldiers also don't need this. Everyone has a family, everyone has children in their own life. Were there among you, for the first or the second time, such soldiers or officers who were eager to fight? First time there was one. One, yes. From how many people? From the whole company, from 70 people. He was the only one. He died. <laughs> Well, in this case, I think his fate was predetermined. But I'm more interested to know why was he eager. Why was he eager? I have no idea why. But he had no family, no wife, no parents. So he was alone. I don't know why he was eager. And how did you know that he was eager to fight? He said it himself. He said, I want to fight. I don't want to leave. Everyone wanted to go home as soon as possible and hoped that it will all end. We were waiting for some negotiations. We had no news. According to rumors, it seemed that something should should be solved by negotiations. But he was saying there is no reason to leave, I want to stay here more. And when did he die? I went out and after two or three weeks he died, when I was in Russia already. The guys told me. And then I've also seen his photo published. As I understand it, those who did not go out got under the sweep of our forces. I don't know, maybe. I have no idea what happened there. Or maybe he just fell somewhere and broke his neck. This is also possible. We'll never know. All clear in general. Will we call? Yes, let's try. I've been trying all this time. She's on WhatsApp and Telegram, but she hasn't received my messages in either. She doesn't answer yet. I'm calling her on the phone. She's not picking up yet. I see that our Dmitro Mikolaevich is trying to reach her and he's not very successful for now. She's at work most likely. Not answering? Her phone is turned off. Then she's at work. Where does she work? She works from 11 in the morning and until 1 or 3 in the morning. It may differ. Relief center, stationary, storekeeper. Is there no connection? They hand over their phones. The storekeeper hands over the phone? They do. It's a Moscow company. Everything is strict there. They hand over their phones. They put them in lockers. Since time zone is the same, she should be at work by now, right? What time is it? Here? Yes, of course, she's at work. She'll have lunch break at 6 or 7 p.m. I propose you send her a voice message. Send a voice message, say whatever you want to say. Take it. Hey, mom, we've been taken to captivity, but nothing happened to us. We've been kept here. Try to contact the draft board or someone else to make them deal with the exchange. Everything is okay in general. Right now we're having a chat with bloggers. Everything is fine, they feed us, no one beats us. The important thing is send her another voice message and ask her to take this video and show it to your officials to prove that you're in captivity and not missing an action. Where can she find the video? My second name is Zolkin. Volodymyr Zolkin. Okay, just a sec. On the internet, on YouTube, you should search Vladimir Zolkin. We are currently recording a video, so you can prove that I'm in captivity and not missing an action. Yes, you said it correctly. Here's my channel. Maybe I should take a picture like this and send it to her. Yeah, do it just in case. Just a sec. So, you gotta find this channel and the video with me, uh, where I tell my story, this conversation. So, you can prove that I'm alive, that I'm in captivity and not missing an action. Million subscribers. Absurd. Thanks a lot. Why do you think is it so few? Million subscribers? Why so few? Yes. They think it's a slander or something? Slander? Well, maybe someone thinks so. 
Also, propaganda is working well in all countries. It maybe works well. Then tell me, are there some propaganda elements in our conversation? Oh no, not propaganda, but disinformation. I used an incorrect word. The thing we're doing at the moment, is this propaganda? No, this is a conversation of two people from different countries. And in fact, a conversation about what's going on. Well, Russians may perceive this as counter-propaganda, maybe, I don't know. It's normal if they perceive it this way. It is even actually what it is. Do you know what's the difference between Russian propagandists and, for example, me? What? The fact that they scream that you need to conquer Kiev. And I don't say that we need to conquer Moscow. You are trying to convey to people. They talk all sorts of nonsense justifying this by the need to die and kill. And I'm talking about the fact that this is nonsense. We can go through all these points, but I see that you weren't interested in this. Have you heard anything about bottle mosquitoes, for example? No. Nibenza was talking about bottle mosquitoes. About contaminated birds from Ukraine. Didn't hear of it either. Didn't hear of it, yes? Maybe you saw a lot of Nazis in here. I didn't see Nazis here. Maybe NATO members? I talk to people here. They have the same opinion. They say we defend our country. Ordinary workers? It seems obvious if you're using the simple logic. I'm just asking why there aren't that many subscribers. I don't understand, because for almost nine months we're recording these videos with you. And here they are. I'll become tired of scrolling them. There are a lot of them here. And all these videos reflect real stories that started happening from the first day of war. People who were captured at the very beginning told them. And now you're telling it. You have a combo, a double story. You managed to end up here twice. It's a unique story. The thing is, that if in the first days they were saying this is a fake, it was possible to understand. But now you can return to any of our videos from six months ago, for example. Compare it with what was really happening, and you'll see that they are actual stories. And the million subscribers is nothing. It's not that I'm fighting for subscribers. I'm fighting for the war to end. And for it to end, there must be at least 50 million of them. And they must be Russians who will listen and draw adequate conclusions. But they don't need it. I think it is yet to come. Dmitry Nikolaevich, do you have any questions? No, I have no questions. Russians, finally start listening a little. I just published a screenshot on my Telegram channel. Your media wrote that some Russian woman said, if I knew that there's a real war out there, I would do anything to prevent my husband from going there. So we've been telling you all this time that there is a war in here. Or to be exact, not even us, not Ukrainians, but your Russians, your people who came here for all this time telling you what's really happening here. Maybe you'll start to listen a little. Because I don't know what else should I do. Did you volunteer to talk? Yes, I did. Well, okay. Oh, wait, I forgot. Say something to other Russians who are about to conscript to Ukraine. Because they were told that they won't fight. Because it's told to everyone. You better don't get conscripted because I'm a conscript myself and I'm in captivity. It means you can be sent to the front line or anywhere else. Better don't do this. Stay at home. Live your life. I don't agree with your thesis that they can. Most likely they will. They can assume that they won't. But according to our experience, they will send you here for sure. Yes, according to our experience, they do. Taking it off? Dmitry Mikhailovich, turn off the light. Let's go. Thank you for watching. Please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. See you next time. Slava Ukraini!